Today is Rosh Hashanah. It begins at sundown tonight. And it's the beginning of that 10-day period that leads up to Yom Kippur. In the Jewish tradition, these 10 days are special. They're set aside. And they're collectively called the Days of Wonder and Awe. And they span a gap between two holidays, New Year's Day, which is tonight, again, and the Day of Atonement, which comes, that's Yom Kippur. Now, what's interesting, uh, or at least what makes it interesting to me, is that it is during this time that the faithful are called to make amends <clears throat> for the wrongs they have committed over the past year. To make amends. Uh, the old word is atone, to atone. Not to repent, not to say, I'm sorry, but to take that extra step, if possible, an attempt to right the wrong, to reach out to those we have done wrong to, those we have harmed, and not only ask for forgiveness, but to ask what of them what we might do now to make things better, to mend that which has been broken, to create wholeness if possible. This is a powerful idea, atonement. <clears throat> Again, it's one of those really old words. And that's what brings me this morning to our monthly theme, because I want to talk to you about something that has been on my heart for some good while now. It has to do with belonging, our monthly Soul Matters theme. It has to do with welcoming, the gateway to belonging. It has to do with growth, the outcome of belonging. It has to do with our relationship, our unnatural, unhealthy, confusing, vexing, troubling, and troublesome relationship to Actually, I bet there's a lot of things we can stuff into that sentence, isn't there, right? What were you all expecting me to say? <clears throat> Republicans, really? Uh, conservatives? Uh, I don't know. Well, look, co contrary to uh, rumor, right, Unitarian Universalism has no problem with conservatives. We are allowed to disagree. There is a caveat, right? Uh, as William Baldwin once wrote, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. <clears throat> but maybe you were going to say something about my uh, or our or your relationship, unhealthy relationship to uh, food. I just want to say, look at me, right? My relationship to food is robust, people. <laughs> or maybe you were thinking about my deep and abiding relationship to the deliciously caffeinated cup of joy that is coffee. And to you, I say, get thee behind me, Satan. No, today I'm going to strike deep into the liberal heart, the you, you soul, if you will, our defining character, our reason for being raison d'etre. Sorry for the French mangling. It's our great purpose, our grand tool, our relationship, our venerated worship of words. Gasp, yes. Yeah, to be fair, there are a lot of things we could talk about that would fit into this category of unhelpful and possibly limiting behavior. And by that, I mean behaviors that are actively or subliminally used to turn away folks from our doors and keep them from coming in in the first place, keep them from returning if they do make it past the door that first or second time, keep them from a full and rewarding experience here of home, of friendship, of belonging. Uh, these are feelings I believe we're trying to encourage, right? Community, beloved community, is what we say every week. And perhaps, just perhaps, if we can atone for our part in the turnings away, 
If we can discover that in part that turning away has been the way that we've held certain words, used certain words, or perhaps turned from using those words, perhaps then we can together create healing, wholeness, belonging. And that is important because it is our aim, our aim, our goal, our great hope for today and all the days to come. Our kingdom come, beloved community. So before we talk about the relationship, let's talk about the words. These terrible, horrible, no good, very bad words. These words that some of us, not all of us, some of us have terrible, horrible, no good, very bad relationships with or experiences with. Words like, wait for it, covenant, grace, faith, Jesus, evil, salvation, God. You know, bad words. Yeah, I'm kidding but only sort of, because while some may have no prior history with, no bad experience with, and no negative feelings about any of these, quote, religious words, there are some here today that do. And maybe that person is you, or the person next to you. But here's the thing. And if we were to stop here this morning, this is the thing I'd like you to take home with you to ruminate and marinate with. Not everyone shares our misgivings. For some church, that is what it is we're doing here uh, this very morning, church means things, things that rely on one or more of these special words. And if we were truly welcoming, truly diverse, truly pluralistic, that is, if we supported and encouraged difference, if we rejected dogma and rejected doctrine and rejected the idea of one single unwavering and unchanging path towards life, towards love, towards wholeness, one and only one truth, if we rejected that, and we do in fact say we reject that, if we rejected that, well, my friends, it might be that we must then allow room for those who carry ideas, experiences, and yes, words other than those that fall on our approved for general use list. And the audacious notion that we should consider is that when we do make room for more than one truth, more than one path, more than one set of experiences. We not only make room for the people who visit us, the people who might want to join us, the people who might benefit from being here with us, we also make room for our own growth, our own new experiences, our own new way of being in the world, that is, we might learn something. A few years ago, I met a woman who was so excited I was gonna become a minister. It was kind of cool. She was absolutely ready to see me up there, here, spreading love and joy, bringing the good news, the gospel, the truth that would burn away the lies. She wanted me to testify, and when I did that, she just knew that all those quote, poor idiots who believed all the wrong things, end quote, would be immediately convinced of the rightness and righteousness of Unitarian Universalism, the end all and be all of all intelligent religion, the best of all religion, the truth of all world religions, world without end, amen. But this story reminds me of all of those who went off to seminary with that evangelistic fire alight in their souls. And there, 
They heard the teachers, read the histories, and discussed the ideas and came away from all of it as atheists. <laughs> Apparently, this happens often. It turns out that if you already have all of the answers, exploring the questions may be hazardous to your faith. Confess. This was this way for me. Of course, I went into seminary as a humanist, and I suppose that in all the ways that matter, I still am. I'm convinced that human destiny is a thing that we make, that we must make it with human hands. And that's my hot take on salvation, in case you were wondering. If we want it, we have to build it. That's not all I came out of seminary with. I went into seminary full of hesitation, full of trepidation. In fact, my entry into seminary was probably delayed by a couple of decades because of that trepidation. I grew up during the time of the so-called moral majority, Billy Graham and Young Life. Not to be too blunt about it, but what I heard from them about Jesus scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> I have never had a personal relationship with Jesus, and honestly, I had a hard time imagining what that might possibly mean. And I know that there are many UUs here that will smugly chuckle into their hands when I say that, as if Jesus is an imaginary friend. Come on. I know because I was one of those people. And yet, this is exactly the tradition that was home to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a serious problem with the word evil. Part of me wants to dismiss that word because I've been taught to not judge other cultures or contexts. But if I am to do so, I should be talking more about modern words like colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, patriarchy, or maybe using some new words like white supremacy culture, heteronormativity, intersectionality, or any of a growing list of indictments that are being made by current thinkers. And yet, when I read the news coming out of Ukraine, I find these new words and lenses and analyses to be rather weak. And while I'm at it, there's another word, one that we you use absolutely appropriated from another tradition. We dusted it off and made it our own. It's, a uni it's not a Unitarian word. It's not a universalist word. It's not even a Christian word. It's covenant. That is a thoroughly Jewish word. And when not used by this community, it gets used by folks who like to also say thee and thou. And others still with some epically bad theology. It's not my favorite word. And there are others. Grace was something my friends' families used to say when I was visiting them for dinner while we sat there and waited for our food to get cold. Faith was a synonym for irrational. And the granddaddy of them all, you know the word I'm talking about. Say it with me. God. Seriously, don't even get me started about God. All of these words are considered trigger words for at least some Unitarian Universalists, and by some I mean me. <laughs> so much so, and for so long now, we tell jokes about it. As I said, for some of us, these words have history. They're tied to bad memories. And used here in a place like this church, they hang like albatrosses around the neck of a free and open tradition. Or so the thinking goes. Many of you here today did not grow up in a UU church. Actually, let's do that real quick. Who grew up in a UU church? Hands raised. You guys in the back row, come on. Smart Alex, that's what we got. 
So nationally, it turns out something like five out of six people that identify as UU today uh, grew up in a different religious tradition, Catholicism, Judaism, one of the mainstream flavors of Christianity, perhaps Hinduism or some other faith, or none of the above. I like to say <clears throat> that Unitarian Universalism is the loose change drawer of American faith traditions. <laughs> Anyone not bolted down somewhere else, are they're free to roll right in. This is there is also a common wisdom that says that there are many of the walking wounded here with us today, folks that carry scars from their religious upbringing, serious scars. And I mean that, and I want to take that seriously. There are folks here that have come here to get away from all of the, well, whatever it is that they left behind. Because here we are a haven of sorts, a place to be together for them, a place to be more than alone and still be separated from all of that other experience. And I, I think that's fair and I wanna honor that. But today marks the days, the beginning of the days of awe and wonder. And we're approaching the day of atonement, a day when we are to get right with those we have wronged and those that have wronged us. And today, I will submit to you, is a fine day for us to begin our reckoning with these sometimes hurtful, sometimes bizarre, sometimes archaic words. Why? Why do this? As I said before, and it's worth repeating, there are those here, perhaps even those sitting next to you right now, Perhaps those who, you, those who have yet to grace our door, people for whom these words have meaning, deep, personal, transformative meaning. And in the spirit of curiosity, in the spirit of forgiveness, of atonement, of love, let us recall our opening words, that all are welcome here in this congregation, where we draw wisdom from all the world's religions balanced with the insights of modern science. You may remember last week, we talked about that word balance, and I'd like to invoke it again right now because today is Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. The year ahead, that year is numbered 5,783. That is a lot of time to be keeping track of. Sometimes it is startling, at least for me, it's startling to realize that our world and the ideas we have in it, the words we use within it, may well be tied to something that is not new at all, but instead something very, very old. And I want us to lean into the idea that what has come before might have something important to say about what might come next. Turning only for the briefest moment to the politics of our day, we see and hear a lot of scary words being tossed around by our leaders, by our would-be leaders. Words like fascist, that's a good word to know. And it's a good word to know that, it is good to know that this word is not a new word. It is good to know that we Americans have a long history with that scary word. It is good to know that we as a people have already wrestled with that word and what that word represents because it tells us that we know how to respond. Those who do not learn it are destined to repeat it. I think at this point we should all apologize to our history teacher. <clears throat> and every history teacher will say that saying at least once during the school year. And this saying is at least in part why I think it is important, important for us to explore these old dry and dusty words, to turn them over, familiarize ourselves with them, to mine them for truth and wisdom, and perhaps to reclaim at least some of them. 5,000, 
783 years of learning, of loving, of human experience, of wisdom. That is not something to casually cast aside. Doing that, my friend, seems brazenly foolish. So here's my confession. I have not come to terms with these terms. I have not made peace with their ancient ways and ancient wars. I have not reconciled my aspirations with their history. I have not done the work to be able to use these old words with authenticity, with authority, with clarity of mind and heart and hand. So that's my challenge and one I will extend to all of you. You don't have to come to any conclusions but this. If and when you hear them out in the world, here in your church, give them space. Words are markers, placeholders for experience and aspiration, and it turns out we you use have a lot to say about them. So my plan for atonement is this. Over the next few weeks, months, and years, we'll be doing some of this work because these ancient words have power, power to harm, yes, but perhaps it's time to remember that they also have power to heal. These are the words and the ways of our ancestors. It may be that they have yet something of value, of worth, of insight to offer to our descendants or maybe something that we can give to each other. We'll see. And no, we're not doing this all next week. But for now, my friends, shalom. Be at peace. May the mystery that transcends all understanding lift you and keep you in these days of awe. Mend the broken. May you be mended. May we all be made whole. And in the spirit of the day, may we all be sealed into the book of life for one more year. Joyously, sweetly, and reverently. Amen. Blessed be. Amen.